Hello, welcome to Question Block. Hi. I'm uh, Wires of NYC, also known as Alex. I'm one of your hosts, one of the co-owners of Secret Loft, and with me is... Arielist. The Arielist of Secret Loft, and uh, Creative Bitch. Mm. <laughs> oh, I forgot to... We gotta get hot on the Twitch. There we go. Yeah, and okay. our our theme on Question Block tonight is camp. Notes on camp. Notes on camp. Not summer camp. But maybe summer camp is pretty campy. <laughs> True. Um, this is a really fun topic. It's the camp aesthetic, if you will. Yes. Okay. It's a really fun topic, and it's it's really fun to like debate what's camp and what's not as well. Yeah, because it's. So quick definition. Can you give them a quick definition of camp? No, and, and that's why we're doing this show. <laughs> well, yeah, it's one, it is one of those, it's sort of like ironic, I suppose. It's you know it when you see it, but okay, it's so hard to pin down. Why might you know camp? Because in 2019, it was the Met Gala's theme, and a lot of celebrities missed the mark. That's why the general population now, today, might know it. Uh, if you were born in like, if you were like our grandparents or like our parents, maybe you'd know like Susan Sontag. And if you were a great, 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 great parents, maybe you'd know Oscar I Wilde. Mean, if you're an intellectual, you should know Susan Sontag. Do you know she was it's Annie true. Leibovitz's partner? Yes, I did. For like decades. Yeah, I did out. not. It makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the two like sort of royal women of New York and culture, I suppose. Um, but yeah, yeah she, she described it in Notes on Camp, this famous essay published in 1964. She described it uh, a bunch of different ways. And I, a thing I that I love that. about that essay is she's like, this is not an essay because camp, like, you ruin it if you look at it too closely. And to try to write an essay about it would itself be campy because it'd be trying to be serious about something that's fundamentally unserious. So instead it's called Notes on Camp, and it's just sort of numbered paragraphs, and there's like, you know... 30 or 40 of them but one of in one of them uh she says it's camp is failed seriousness so uh, it says one is to start very generally camp is a certain mode of aestheticism mm -hmm. is one way of seeing the world as an aesthetic phenomenon that way the way of camp is not in terms of beauty but in terms of degree of artifice of stylization mm -hmm. so yes there's there's also she breaks down the the difference between a lot of what we perceive as high art or fine art has a sort of morality to it. It's trying to be the most revealed tr human truths and beauty. Um, but a big part of art is also the actual like approach of it, the aesthetics of it, like how it's done, uh, how a Broadway show is performed and written, for example, how a movie is shot, all the choices a director makes. Yeah. And camp, for the most part, doesn't care about the morality of the thing being done. It, it is fundamentally concerned with the, the aesthetics and how the thing is executed. So, okay, what's like the first, when you think of camp, like one, two, three, go, what's like the first thing that you the think room. of? The movie, the film, The Room, widely regarded as uh, the, it could be the worst movie ever made. If not that, it's Plan 9 from Outer Space. How about you? If I had to think of a movie, I would think of Pink Flamingos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then I would just say like drag. Yeah, drag is, is camp. Very camp. <laughs> like that's. So we will talk about also. There's a difference between intentional and unintentional. But no, but this okay. Yes, but I'm just saying like, that's these are like some easy to access. Oh sure. Things you know. Things that you've seen. Some that's things, true. A lot of people probably haven't seen these cult classic terrible movies. Yeah. So like at the very beginning of this essay, there's. Uh, Sontag gives examples. But they're all like 1960s references. They are, right. So. so, well, I mean, like, okay, Swan Lake, Tiffany's Lamps, like, those those things. Some sort of, of these are debatable, though, right? Flash Gordon could, comics. Flash Gordon, sure. I mean, just Marvel, like, and superheroes in general are camp because, right, it is like, it takes a very serious approach, right? Like the Avengers Endgame or whatever. But, like, they're all wearing underwear and flying around and like 
yeah, the Hulk turns into a giant green guy who smashes yeah. stuff. It's a fundamentally like fun thing. So to write, make a very serious movie about it, or like let's give a yeah. let's give a history of it because that'll like a quick history because that'll like also sure. help. Zack Snyder films are a great to example. Contact. We're Just, gonna cut sure. into that batch. Okay, so who's like number Hit one? Hit me up with the history. Well, we'll go back and forth. Okay. So your favorite guy ever? It's our favorite monarch. <laughs> Louis XIV. It's Louis the Fourteenth. The calf showing, gay as fuck. The inventor of ballet inventor. Of modern ballet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, He's and a great like, dancer himself, and the inventor of fashion. Uh, yeah, exactly. Of couture. Of couture, sure. He oh had, yeah, fashion. Fashion is camp. Fashion sure. is camp. Um, yeah, because in the end, it's just clothes. But uh, so he's like where we all start and like that kind of baroque aestheticism like where it's over the top it's like too much because yeah so him is the sun king wearing like an outfit completely made of gold or just the palace of versailles with like rooms completely covered in in handmade golden carved like little filigrees like everywhere even the fact that he had his ballet like his ballets were starring him and they were like three days long in real time. <laughs> like that's camp. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, and they, the irony of Louis Fourteenth is it's like, it both was camp and almost the reverse because like the way he set up his court is to like be a, a noble in his court. You had to like participate in all this. You had to go to all the balls. You had to participate in his bedtime routine. That's um, campy. Yeah. He's like, watch me undress. But these were like the most important affairs of state. Like, this is how you became like close to the monarch is you had to then like empty his chamber pot in the morning and participate in his waking and up people ceremony. Did it with such like preciousness with reverence. and yeah. reverence. That's what makes it campy. Like, yeah. Um, and I think around then, that was when the first like use of the word, maybe it was slightly a little after that, but it was like, it was like, uh, I think it was like a stage direction or something, and it was like it was like stand on one leg, stick your calf out, like like a campy ass bitch. Someone said, yeah, I was camping about like a clown, like a comedy king. Oh, comedy king. Okay. Yeah, but that's like the when you see Louis the Fourteenth, like that's the pose that he's in. He's like, look at my sexy ass calf, like he's just sort of sticking his leg out, which is super cute. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so that's like I think the first time that it was. The actual word is used in this sense. Yeah, the very serious approach to just gaudy ostentatiousness. And, like, something that when you look at it, you're like, it's just clearly in, like, bad taste because it's so over the top. Um, and you're just like, it's, it's so bad, it's too good. Much, too much. It's um, so good, it's bad. It's so, yeah. exactly. And so after that, we get into, like, the Victorian esque, like, the. Wait, am I totally in two different... When Oscar Wilde kind of versus the Victorians? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, that's like mid-1800s. Okay, they're both around the same time? Sure. I always forget. Yeah, let's, let's say that they are for this. The 1800s. Yeah. There is someone who I really I really love who did like a full rundown of the Met Gala, but was trying to give the historic context and got it so much more wrong than we're going to get it. So, yeah. Yeah, we're, we'll at least put it in the right century. So. Yeah. Oscar. But that's campy, getting your Pretty sure Oscar Wilde, yeah, mid, mid-1800s, so. Yeah, Oscar Wilde is also a camp queen because, d- like, dandyism, basically. So being so sort of so masculine about... that you're feminine. Yeah. And so feminine that you're masculine, again, <laughs> I guess. That he, yeah, I mean, he was like a, a big, tall, handsome guy who absolutely loved clothing. Um, yeah. And was very much a dandy and cared a lot about his appearance and his hair and everything. Um, but also was like, uh, I guess was sort of a heartthrob, but was also gay. Um, yeah. And then was just sassy AF. Um, yeah, his letters. And so his... The tea that was spilled. Yeah, a lot of his, his writing and short stories and plays, I guess, deal with... They're very just droll. The witticisms in them are like... Oh my God, very much okay. His thing. The importance of being earnest is like the campiest fucking... Mm-hmm. I mean, because there's legit like these two ch- women and they're, they don't like each other. 
they're pissed at each other and they're having like the campiest tea party ever where it's mm-hmm. like there's like uh, extravagant cucumber sandwiches and they're like oh would you like some milk in your tea and like the uh, the one girl's like no no thank you and the other one just like dumps milk in her tea <laughs> okay. you know it's like so they're just so like backhanded and they're like oh you know they're trying to be all um proper but they're just being cunty as fuck and it's very it's very That's campy wonderful. yeah and also the picture of dorian gray is pretty it's it's pretty campy because the the idea of it, I think, is is can be like because they got um, Oscar Wilde got the idea because him and his friend were at this. They were like painting some young, like hot dude, and when they left, they were like, "Oh, it's such a shame that he's gonna get old and ugly." Yeah. And then Oscar Wilde is like, "I think I'll write a book about that, a play about that, no, it's a book. or a book, yeah, a little novel." But. uh I don't know. That's I don't know if I would extend the, call that camp because it doesn't. It's not extravagant or over the top as a story. When you actually read the thing, you're like, hmm, pretty engaging, like short story with a moral to it. I just think it's over the top it's how art. he came up with the idea, okay. though. I just think that's like it's such a because it's like so aesthetic related. I guess I don't know. Um, it's like such a dramatic like. Yeah, he's like, I want to write a book where the most horrible thing ha- that happens is like, is like getting older. I don't know. I just I like that where it's like making something that's I guess trivial, like your looks, you know, well, into something he, important. Yeah, it's not just that he ages. He's like he when once the painting starts collecting, like it's the, it's his age, but also his sins. So he like murders people and like knocks up all these prostitutes and has them get abortions and stuff and like yeah. things that would like cause lines or gray hair I guess in the portrait it starts looking worse and worse because yeah. of all these sins but uh yeah that he gets a painting to take the fall for him yeah oh yeah so Sontag also makes the point though because you were saying it's the Victorians right which is like now post-industrial revolution mm-hmm. right and that uh a huge part of like in order to have camp or appreciate it is you have to be able to kind of like look at art and like raise an eyebrow and it kind of comes from a place of like the like who used to set the bounds of culture or get to like determine what was good and bad was pretty much the aristocracy you had to have money to be able to then like have aesthetics to appreciate art or say what was good or bad and then in the victorians sort of also um and then sontag really points out i don't want to jump ahead too far here it yeah. basically is the the emergence of camp is basic, is is in many ways uh, people proclaiming themselves the new arbiters of culture who weren't necessarily aristocrats who basically and it oh yeah she like. says it basically is the gays um, in in the sixties um, she just, she's like the home the two arbiters of our culture the what is she the the uh, entrepreneurs of our culture right now are the Jews and the homosexuals true <laughs> true true. I guess, um, and yeah, and she, I guess, uh, has some pop psychology reasons for it, but she does make the point that they, people who sort of profess to love camp or are, who are connoisseurs of it, have appointed themselves to be the new ambassadors of like what is art, what is what has value, what is good and what is bad, um, and it's not based on money; it's just based on having a, a sort of refined sense of taste. But you can have a shit sense of taste and still, like, that's the thing. Camp isn't good. So, like, and no one gets to decide what it is. That's, like, I think a huge thing. Like, it just Mm -hmm. is. If it's not, it's not. And, like, if it is, it is. And, like, But things that are agreed upon as good camp versus just being bad art, for example. Well, if something is campy, it's an aesthetic, right? And if Mm -hmm. if it's not campy, it can just be shitty. And that's that's kind of what I think you're saying in like a nicer way. Yeah, and there are certain things that you, you miss look for. the mark, and you're not extravagant yeah. enough. Even but. in good camp, is there's there should be a coherence to it. So people, I mentioned the room before, and a, the thing about the room is every single thing that could be bad about a film is bad in this film. The writing is terrible. The directing is terrible. The editing makes no sense. The sound is bizarre. The acting is terrible. Wardrobe is ridiculous. Well, wh- who directed it? Who did it? Tommy Wiseau, who's okay. also the star. So did he do it? Can 
uh, did he do it um, in in earnestness, or did he do it on purpose he to did. be bad? He did. He wanted to. Be, he's like the. He's a Greek guy who's a, like inherited. Why did you? Oh, why did you put his 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 race? his race oh he inherited a bunch of money from like an, a greek oh. oil magnate or whatever okay. and so he uh from a with that cheese. he was able to just like shoot his like completely finance and produce his own movie and all the actors on the movie were like what the fuck is happening okay so because he did it in earnest that's like one of the most purest forms because he also turned into a cult classic himself because he would rent a theater in like los angeles every saturday night to air to screen his own movie because he thought it was good or because he thought it was good and and like people had just had to see it and that and then it became a cult classic because of that yeah so that's like the most the most purest form is like when there's someone who's who just is like they're like this is my art and i love it and it's precious and it's just a piece of shit but it's like coherently a piece of shit and so then it becomes like a cult Mm -hmm. classic yeah because you watch it and you're like it's so it's so terrible, but like it beca- there's a purity to it it's, that is really admirable. Yeah, um, it's kind of okay. So here's like an interest of thing that I like John Waters, right? Mm. So he, do you think that he knows that his work is like as um, God, who Stephen King used to say, like I write salami. And, like, my salami might be really good, but it's still salami at the end of the day. Like, he knows that his work isn't, like... He wasn't trying to do high art. Crime rib or whatever, you know? He's not trying to write a a postmodernist, like, you know, manifesto, like, magnum opus or anything. Do you think that John Waters knows... Like, you think he knows... You think he knows that his stuff is salami, right? Yes. Okay. So yeah, he's. A, I mean, he's clearly a very smart. In person. some ways, the room so, like, dude has like a pure version of camp than John Waters. He does. That's <gasps> why. That's specifically Gag. why I named the room. <laughs> the other movie I named was Plan Nine from Outer Space, which is the worst. It's probably the worst movie I've ever made, but it's a science fiction <laughs> movie uh, from I think the '60s. But it's it's the same thing. The edits just don't make. Suddenly, there's just like a new character, like with ten minutes left in the movie. Uh, yeah, it's sort of a war war of the worlds, but there's also vampires involved. It just that's yeah. awesome. It's just a train wreck. Yeah, but if someone had set out to intentionally make that movie, yeah, you couldn't. You couldn't, but also then it would be like not coherent, I guess. So yeah, so so people have there's this debate, right? Like movies that are intentionally campy, like Sharknado or uh, Snakes on a Plane, where like. <laughs> I'm just saying, we got to get these motherfucking snakes mm-hmm. off this motherfucking plane. Oh, great plane. line. Yeah. And, like, Samuel L. Jackson, like, hams the fuck out of it because he knows exactly what he's doing, and it is hilarious. And not to say, like, it, I mean, the movie as a whole act, actually isn't hilarious or even worth your time because it's not so bad, it's good. It's just bad, but Samuel L. Jackson is fun to watch as an actor. So it's good. But, uh... No, the movie itself is bad, though. You can't... You see, you watch, you're like... You're checking your watch. You're like, right, when are the snakes going to show up? <laughs> Wait, how do... Okay, no, sorry. That's for another... I'm like, I'm... How do they even that, get on the motherfucking plane? Save that for the reptiles episode. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, so let's... Let's, let's I have go all the way back to our history, okay. though, because it is worth kind of finishing up how it... So, like, Oscar Wilde and the Victorians. Yeah. And we kind of said the Victorians was when you actually had sort of, like started to have mass manufacturing and, like, a sense of, like, mass-produced goods and commercialism and so, like, low culture and high culture um, when, like, things being, like, handmade or custom-made was different. Yeah, the Victorians have some, like, awesome Christmas cards that we talked about in our, like, goth So, yeah, the turn of the century, I guess. So, yeah, late, (laughs) uh, late 1800s Christmas cards that we showed off. Um, yeah, they're just, they're awful. Like, there's, like, a dead bird, and it's, like, may your Christmas be a jolly one. The weird, tur- the weird walking turnip There's a creature. turnip. Yeah, it's just, they're so absurd, and you're like, what? But they loved them. They really, I think they got a kick out of them. They they yeah. were like, these are these are funny. These are going to baffle people in the year 2020. So, what, what's the difference between kitsch and camp? Yeah, so, right, so, so, uh, Kitsch is is sentimental. It is in in no way like 
ironic or winking at you. Kitsch really is just embracing the thing. So, and often like... Give me an example. I don't know. So camp generally doesn't... Also generally like, with give the exception of the Tiffany lamps, camp generally refers to a performance or okay, a like Okay, give me an film. example. So kitsch would be like a, a snow globe with like a little child, like rosy cheek child in it or whatever. Stuff that's just like very cutesy. That evokes like a feeling of sentimentality. How? Um, okay, wait, wait, wait. Okay. The snow globe, could we make it campy? What could we do? Yeah, so the key, How? if we were to make like a, I always think if you're going to make something campy, you think about putting it into a show or a movie because often it has okay, to be Okay, do without doing right? that, we, we only have hot glue and like crap. We're at Michael's. How do we make it campy? You try to make the most fantastic. How? Awe-inspiring snow globe you could. <laughs> right? I want to know how. So like, I mean, certainly you'd like. We put pink snow in it, right? Sure. You put, okay. you put some gaudy colors in it. And then you'd like, you'd have to put like, you're like, I'm going to put every sad character ever in the snow globe. So you'd have like Tiny Tim and like Oliver Twist and like. The Turnip Man? The Turnip Man. <laughs> there and, we go. And Dead Birds and like Jesus in a little manger. And I put Jesus in. I don't even know how you do I think this. I like adding Jesus off. actually makes things pretty camp. Like I think G- Jesus, glitter, Oh, that's a real... <laughs> that can, like, real camp shortcut. shortcut. Yeah. A camp shortcut. I think I like that, like, turning things from... That's a really good thing, because if you... When you invoke religion, which, like, inherently wants to be taken seriously, and is, or whatever, yes. suddenly it's like, if you're doing a bad job, then you're, like, you have failed <laughs> at seriousness at whatever thing you're trying to do. So, yeah. uh... Yeah, the buddy Jesus from Dogma... That Jesus oh. with the two thumbs up is like a great example of like or uh, Korean Korean Jesus Christ from sure, 20, Korean 21 Jesus Jump. from Twenty One Jump Street the remake yeah yeah um, yeah that's a good point that uh, and because so much of religion really is a moral religious art is moral it's trying to like right transcend be <laughs> transcendent why... and like inspiring and so making like shitty religious art that Jesus remember the monk repainted that. I don't know if you follow this news story. It was like... Well, I don't follow the news. Like Ten years ago, there was this monk, I think in Brazil, who, like, found this, like, uh, like ancient, like, painting of Jesus by some, like, Renaissance master. Uh, no, it was somewhere in Europe. But he, okay, whatever. he tried what to he restore do? it himself. What? And okay. so, like... And he didn't know how to paint and, or, like, have any, like, access to techniques or anything. So... <laughs> So the re- then he restored it, and when he revealed it, it took him, like, years. He revealed it, and Jesus looked like a, this horrible, creepy monkey. <laughs> he had, like, extended his hairline down so it was just around his face. Oh, my God. Um, so that was, like, a great that's a Literally, great oh, my God. <laughs> that's great. Oh, that's awesome. We should, yeah. So, well, since it's a podcast, you guys can go look that up. That's the so aid. funny. Yeah, and so a lot of the movies... We can talk about, like, old Hollywood, um, the Ziegfeld Follies. Like, those are all, like, campy. So, yeah, the next movement we would talk about would be Art Nouveau, which is, like, very early 1900s, right? And during, like, the Belle Epoque or whatever. And uh, Art Nouveau is a very, as an art style, is, like, very ornate, very pretty. And that's considered, like, a lot of it's considered camp um, because it's, like, over the top. Flor- every letter has like crazy flourishes on it um, but also because like the acting and the performing because a lot of these actors were coming and dancers whatever they were coming from like the theater and now there's film all of a sudden and so like they're still extremely exaggerated oh in the early yeah well, well that's post post uh, Art Nouveau I'm just oh, saying okay. the, the as far as like stylistically the Tiffany lamps would be like they're inspired by Art Nouveau that's one reason. Oh, the like beaded flappy. dresses, like that's flappers. Flappers but that's around are that time. Susan Sontag, yeah, that's true. Yeah, flappers around that time. So Susan Sontag. Cites I'm the failing flappers. at seriousness. I'm being campy. You're doing great. <laughs> um, yeah. The beaded dresses. The oh yeah, like the cigarette girls. Feather boas. The cigarette girls. If we're thinking like drag queens, it's like a very violet tchotchke. Yes, it also is. <laughs> was very much the emergence of, uh, not the emergence, but it, it was like 
a big mm-hmm. part of camp is often, and we haven't even really covered this yet, is the the epicene. Yes, I was and just gonna say that. Oh so my god, the, we're so the on merging the same of page. masculine and feminine qualities, sort of because androgynous qualities. All the um, the suits for men were like very well fit. They were like kind of like they were like well fitted, formed, and then like for women, those flapper dresses and stuff were like not feminine. Like they were like very baggy. Very baggy. Yeah, and the hair was like very masculine. For women, like the bob. The bob was scandalous. Yeah. So that was very, very campy. But yeah, the the mo- you said the, like movies, right? So there was like all these movies. Um, so yeah, then that then we're getting into the sort of thirties, forties, golden age of Hollywood. Yeah, and they had you know they spoke in Atlantic, which do your best Atlantic. I have a list of the movies. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you the Jesus Restoration. Oh, okay. Sorry for those listening to the podcast. We'll describe. But show it to me you. later. I it's not good for the. Um. It's worth it. I'll let, I'll let that load. Well, but but yeah, uh, I have a, I do have. Yeah, a list do you want to talk it. about your your campy movie favorites? Oh, I just have like a list of like the most. Yeah, we'll talk. Yeah, well, I think mommy mommy dearest is the is like pretty fucking campy. Um, so May West is cited as very campy. Um, yeah. Oh, I was gonna say, do your best like Atlantic accent. Of that style. Do <clears> it <throat> on the spot. Um, honey, I don't know why I came down here to do this podcast. <laughs> I'm burning up one of these lights, you see. Queen oh, that's like, like your me May. Doesn't come down for anyone. <laughs> that's, that's like your May West. Sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't, don't you come know. around here and <laughs> podcast me in the ass sometime? <laughs> okay. Um, no, Atlantic is very it's like. Atlantic. Yeah, I'm talking on the radio, <laughs> and I've I'm used to talking in the theater, and I don't realize that there's a microphone. <laughs> yeah, like that's kind oh. of. Oh, I see. Ma- I mean, have you seen Mommy Dearest? No, I have not. Oh my god, it's so freaking over the top. Here, pull up if you're gonna. Oh yeah. Oh my god, this. Uh, Just showing off the. This Jesus is not looking healthy right the now. The Jesus transition is great. This is a great example of, uh... <laughs> this is just ruining religious art. Yeah. The performance of restoring the painting and turning it yeah. into that, uh... Yeah, that, that's like a Mr. Bean sketch. It's wild. Um, yeah. Mommy Dearest, like, it, it, the... I think it was Faye... Who was the one from Chinatown? Faye... Faye Dunaway? Faye Dunaway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's kind of pissed because she she said that they only used her like most dramatic takes, and she actually thinks that Joan Crawford. She likes Joan Crawford. This is a movie about Joan Crawford. It's it, the movie of the tell-all book that Joan Crawford's like adopted daughter wrote about how abusive Joan Crawford was to her. Okay. And Faye really liked Joan. Crawford and she's been quoted many times as saying like only God knows if like the abuse was real or not but she doesn't think that she really abused her and she she said the directors only used her her most like dramatic takes but they're so over the top like I'm you know, I'm sure you know the the wire hangers were like so basically the Joan Crawford character is mm-hmm. like you know her she sees that like her daughter has wire has wire hangers um her dresses and she's like i've gotten you the most beautiful dresses and you you know you hang them on wire hangers and she's like no more wire oh. hangers i'll show you and she starts oh, beating she the shit out of her with <laughs> wire yeah and then there you know the barbara please where she's like barbara please like that's like a very drag. Oh. Yeah, I have all the I, wires of NYZ loves to distract me by pulling up stuff that I've pre pulled up on my iPad, which is right here if oh. you want to see right. things. Continue. Um, I'm just looking at my notes. Yeah, so it's super campy and over the top, and they, you know, they put it out, and then they were like, "Oh, people think of this as like not a serious movie," so they so they like remarketed it, and. <laughs> Yeah, and now oh, it's as like, like as a comedy, I suppose. Yeah, as like a cult, you know, co- you know, thing. And then, um, I would say ro- people know Rocky Horror Picture Show. 
Yes. But see, Mommy Dearest is like pure camp because they didn't, they made it as a serious movie. Yes. <laughs> and then they were like, wait a second. Rocky Horror is intentionally a very silly movie. Right. Um, and uh, I think Pink Flamingos mm-hmm. is, it's, I mean, it's, it's very camp. It's so ridiculous. And Divine is so ridiculous. I mean, yeah, Divine eats. <laughs> Do you know that Divine, like, actually ate dog shit in that yes, movie? Yes, that's a famous fact that everyone knows about. Yeah. Pink Flamingo. And you know that the dog that they were using wouldn't shit <laughs> on that day. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, so I don't John. Know the, full, the full story. So just real quick John Waters and. Divine, they were, they were, they live like down the street from each other, but they met like later mm-hmm. in life and, or in their 20s. And, um, John, John Waters was like, you know, I guess everyone looked at Divine as like kind of like ugly or gave her like bat, like these like mean glances. And John Waters, like, I thought she's the most beautiful person ever. John Waters gave her the name Divine. Because he liked the definition of divine in the dictionary. He was like, wow, what a cool definition. So gave her that name. He also, on an airplane somewhere, he, like, told her to go in the bathroom and, like, shave her hairline back and, like, shave her eyebrows off. And they beat her face on the airplane. She came off as divine and she basically never went back. Oh, so she, he and, and divine developed, like, the character. her very distinctive style and character. yeah. And someone else did her makeup, but the, that makeup artist was like, go in the plain bathroom, shave, like, all your shit off, and then, uh-huh. um... And they drew on some, some They invented eyebrows. the cut crease on that airplane. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, she would do kind of whatever John Waters asked her to do, because they were, like, really good friends, and she trusted him, and... He asked her, he was like, would you eat dog shit for me? And she was like, yeah, of course. And then, like, a year later, he's like, the day has come. And there, the dog just, like, w- that day wasn't going. They had to give it, like, an enema. <laughs> and then she doesn't actually swallow it, though. She, like, she she just, like, chews it. And then you can see her gagging in the actual <laughs> movie. It's, like, really gross. It's so gross. It's so gross. Yeah. But it was done in, you know, John Waters was like, he goes, he was like, I only asked for one take. I mean, I'm not, he's like, I'm not a sadist or anything. Like. So the, right, the plot of the movie is that it's the contest to be the most disgusting person. Yes. And the contestants take it very seriously. Yes. And do like really outrageous And they get really upset to too. Yeah. Like they're like, I'll show you disgusting. <laughs> it's like. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm my my uh, outfit reference. By the way, is so I'm I feel okay. So I'm referencing the Bjork. Exactly. Swan. Tell them what you're wearing. You're wearing a hot so I'm pink wearing a suit. hot pink latex bodysuit. I have a wig. a wig with the hardest of fronts. Mm-hmm. Like this is a bad wig, mm-hmm. um, but I'm making it look good because I can do that. You you have. <laughs> Three eyelashes. Yeah, I have no more than three eyelashes. And I have a flamingo's neck around my neck, like Bjork with her swan dress. So I'm referencing Bjork, but I'm the lights just went out because I'm so snatched right now. I turn the lights out. Yeah, there it is. Um, so I'm referencing Bjork, but also pink flamingos. So it's like, yeah. But because I'm really trying, I guess I'm failing at camp. And because we're talking about it, I guess it's not campy. And then yeah, what are you wearing? So, so this is great because this is a... I'm wearing a crown first off. But more important is my shirt, which is a... I forget even the context of which I came up with it. But it's a mythical Your burlesque creature. name. Oh, my burlesque name would be Chinchilla Fuego. And so... Uh, you had a shirt made that it had where you photoshopped a chinchilla and made it like Cheetos flaming hot red color. And then the shirt is entirely covered with pictures of that chinchilla and its weird eyeball. It's weird purple eyeball. Yeah. Um, so it's horrifying. <laughs> if from a distance, it looks like I'm wearing a bunch of organs almost. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's, 
But it's it's because so there's a burlesque performer in New York City named Chris Harder, and he, shout out, we love you, you're campy as fuck. Um, he has a bodysuit with him. He has many bodysuits with mm-hmm. himself over and over and over again his, on his it. His face patterned over and over. And yeah. so this, and he has like a little Ken doll that looks like him with the same bodysuit. So that was like the inspiration for this shirt. I think just repeated, that's another thing. Like if you, one, it's like Dapper Dan. If you repeat a logo like a bunch of times or mm. Andy Warhol, the soup cans, like it or loses. Right. It loses its importance. Mm-hmm. But then becomes more Yeah, it important. becomes a design element instead of, like, the logo. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this shirt is also... It's great because this is the kind of thing that... It's marketed to people as, like, do you love your pet? Like, on yeah. Instagram, they're like, get your your cat on your socks or whatever. Or you can have your dog's face printed all over and over on, like, a shirt, which is, like... A very silly, like, low art consumer grade thing that's like marketed to, like, you know, doofuses in the Midwest or whatever. And then to take and be like, I love that. Yeah. I want a chinchilla fuego of that. (laughs) And, like, is is now. They must have made it a camp aesthetic. I wonder what they thought. Like, when you ordered it? Yeah, they were like, oh my God. They're like, not not the weirdest thing I've seen in the last hour, even. Yeah, (laughs) probably. They're constantly getting, like, yeah, this is just a red chinchilla, but they're like, oh, shit, I didn't know chinchillas came in that color. All right, cool. Cool. And then they're like, they've got more chinchillas. And I like, didn't know they came in that color. And like, all right, next up, the shirt of that guy's penis. We just have to like, print over and over again. <gasps> oh, my goodness. And somebody had to pattern this, you know. Somebody had to get into paint and, like, layer all the chinchillas Yeah, the chinchillas, which is campy. It's pretty darn campy. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so... The movies, oh, what do you think of, right, you said Planet Nine, the Planet Nine thing. Planet Nine from Outer Space. Okay. And The Room are both uh, unintentional camp, and they're just like, atrociously bad movies, but in a, like, consistent, uh, almost admirable, how, how just terrible they are through and through, uh, both those films. There's, a, there's, like, a famous Seinfeld episode, well, they're all famous to me, but there's a <laughs> Seinfeld episode where they're, waiting in the lobby of a Chinese restaurant to, like, have dinner. And the whole episode is them waiting to get seated. But they're waiting. They're going to eat dinner and then go see Plan 9 from Outer Space. And so it's, like, the fact they can't get into the restaurant is, like, they're going to miss the movie now. <gasps> Gag. Gagatrandra. But it's super Seinfeldian that, like, yeah, they're, they're, the movie they're going to see is, like, this very campy sci-fi movie. Because, like, what else would hip New Yorkers, like, Jerry, be waiting to I'm upset. I'm upset. I can't get it. <laughs> Where would we like to see the movie? Oh, so I have, yeah, I have the list of, like, campy Oh, yeah, Adam movies. West is Batman. Yes. We can kind of jump around. Rocky I Horror suppose. Picture Show. I don't care about that one. Not not Rocky. Oh, Tu Wong Fu with uh, Thanks for Everything, Julie it's, Newmar. Because it's drag, honey. It's drag, but it's also, like, the plot is so crazy. Like, yeah, Mommy Dearest, uh... Pink Flamingos, mm. The Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, oh, Barbarella, and I was I was laughing before because Blackula, which I oh, didn't yeah. even know. So, so exploitation movies, which are B-movies, fit like right into the realm of Is Get of Out camp. campy? No. That's, it's just like a pretty well done horror film. Okay. Um. Is, is Sorry to Bother <laughs> You campy? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, don't want to spoil it, but especially, spoil like, it. the turn it takes in the last third the of the The Equus Sapiens! The Equus Sapiens, That's when it becomes camp. At yeah. first, it's just, like, a parody of, like, working in a call center and, like, American consumerism or but whatever. But also, like, the, the but, co- like, like, the weird surreal, I guess surrealism is a big part of it, because, like, the copier, remember, like, in the other room, the copier's just, like, exploding and they're like yeah they're, but there's just hints of it around the edges right and the code the code for the, the elevator code that takes like, like a full minute yeah. to punch in like there's hints of like very silly things happen and then the movie just goes like off the rails in the last like third. the worst people and yeah the worst it's people. so good um um oh i want to say so right blackula is like classic like exploitation film or whatever or black exploitation film but also we watched uh dolomite 
Dolomite, yes. Which is a great film. The The recent Eddie Murphy movie is, that was called My Name is Dolomite. And then Dolomite was the actual movie. Yeah. But Dolomite's a great example cause it, of camp. Because it was made, they were very serious. Like, the character was a joke, but they were serious about trying to make an action movie with that character. Yeah. And, like, I think that's what, like, My Name is Dolomite kept captures their like earnestness of like the film crew yeah it's very sweet it is sweet though it's sweet there's like sweet moments i think there probably is with a lot of like stuff that gets later seen as camp is there is a naivete and like do you say naivete yeah naivete and how it's made (laughs) and like there is a sweetness to like a lot of it which to to be clear to like consider something camp and appreciate as such is to love it while also feeling some revulsion to towards it and yes. Oh, yeah. That that um. What was it? Hot lim, hot, hot lim mode was like. I hate it. It's the worst thing ever. But I love it. But I love it because yeah. of that. But Susan Sontag says she's like you. If you absolutely love and are like a cultural movement, you can't critique it. You're part of it. You can only express it. You. It has to be coupled with some level of like also hatred for and revulsion for the thing. <laughs> Uh, so that you can love it for all of its qualities, while still realizing it's. I suppose it's faults. Oh, um, okay, so we got we have the ba- Batman, the movie, which, yeah, just these, like, fucking well, costumes just, with the masks are so you funny. Show them off. Adam West Batman. Yeah. Right? Because they're, I mean, that, that movie, like, famously has inspired, like, tons of parodies. Is like, because the a, seriousness Do a thing of, from it. Do a thing. The like, seriousness of Adam do a thing. West. Be like. He's like a detective. I'm trying to think of be like, his voice and what he would say. Don't they hello? talk like no, this? No, he's like, no. hello, Commissioner Gordon. Oh. I'll be right there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Robin, right. hop on my back. I'll carry you downtown. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, oh, we have Faster Pussycat Kill Kill. Romy and Michelle's High School Reunion. Classic. Is that campy just because of the outfits? Yeah, yeah, and just like... I guess they're campy. Maybe the movie. I don't know. Also, the dance. Dude, the fucking dance at the end, time after time. It's funny because that scene makes the, the whole film. It, like, Alan coming as, like, the fucking rich dude. Showgirls. Classic. I feel like any movie or sh- sick soap opera or anything where there's, like, a lot of, like, bitch slapping and, like, possibly, like, drink throwing Mm-hmm. That's like, you know, sure. like, ah, you know, like, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's like pretty, ca- that's, that makes a campy situation. Oh yeah, whatever happened to Baby Jane? That movie's like, I can't watch that movie. It's like so sad to me. I don't, Maybe it's so not. sad. Like, I actually get sad by it. Maybe that's campy of me. <laughs> it's, it is. Uh, mm-hmm. Xanadu. Uh, all right. Beaches. Beaches with Bette Midler. That's also like a really. Oh, and duh, fucking. Uh, Wizard of Oz. I couldn't think of the name. Yes, the Wizard of Oz. Very. Um, yeah, and there are certain performers who are like, their whole thing is, is camp. So, like, that's why we opened with Cher. Yeah. Like, renowned for Ooh, like we wearing should like go... all like crystal outfits and stuff. We should be like intentional or 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 not. Okay, Should we sure. go through? Like, okay, Liberace. <laughs> what do we uh, Intentional. Okay. Um, so Cher. Do you think Cher is like, is like, I'm, now Cher knows, but like, do you think she's like, I'm the beautiful, like, which she is, but like, do you think those dresses and stuff, she's like, I'm classy bitch, or is she like, I want extravagance? Yeah, no, I think she was like, this is the most like beautiful resplendent like outfit I could wear so to sing she, my like gorgeous songs that are like and these are like world changing like she wasn't just like this is a catchy pop song she was like this is this is I believe in life after love this is yeah. why I have to sing my truth I believe in life after love <laughs> um, wait is it life after love yes life after love okay Do you I was after like love? Ooh, that could be, like, a really creepy song if it was, like, Love After Life. That would be, like, a Sharon Needle song. Ooh. Like, yeah. Yeah. Email that out. Drop it in the Sharon Needles suggestion box. Yeah. At SharonNeedles.org. Dot, dot, witch.com. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Um, let's see. Oh, um, oh, the t- dude, the the tiger dude. Tiger King. Yeah, he's isn't he campy? So there's a line. There is a line between campy and just trashy. Because so much of Tiger King is you're like these are just like these are trash people behaving these in a are trash. trash. Yeah, and then like yeah. So I don't know. <laughs> Come like, on, when he's holding the tiger and I, he's like he's like cute. there's nothing wrong with like. There's people who love tigers, and tigers love those people. Yeah, I mean, I and feel like that's kind of campy. With that. I feel like that. Yeah, particular scenes. Because he's, like, very earnest about it. It's yeah. true. Yeah. You're right, and there is a sincerity there. Although, yeah, it's funny because it's, yeah, she needs a documentary that is, like, edited, I think, in a very, like, whoever edited that documentary, like, knew what was going on, I guess. Yeah, well, oh, yeah, we were talking about Best in right. Show but this morning. It's... Yeah. Like that, like... Well, no, so, so like, Tiger King, I would... Yeah, Best in Show is not an example. Best in Show is so well done as, like, a mockumentary. Yeah. And they're they're perfect. But that's that, like, intentional. That it's intentional camp, but it's good. It's intentional, intentional camp, camp that's done exceptionally well. Yeah, the seriousness okay. of all the characters is they do these very silly things and behave in, like, silly ways is, like, perfect. And it's never so over the top that it's not believable. It's, like, always just, like... Could it could be real? Is what's so beautiful about all of like, yeah, yeah, it that, is real. That like film collectives movies or whatever. They're like, yeah, you're like, is the a documentary about the Westminster Dog Show? I don't understand. Um, yeah, they're just bizarre <laughs> enough that it gets right. Like this is Spinal Tap could be a real the Westminster Penis Show. Yes, that's your camp fantasy. Yeah. Um. Oh, I was going to say Barbara Streisand and, like, Yentl. Yes! Okay, was that... Was she for real? Did she... Was she, like, Papa, can you hear me? Was she, like, for real? Was that her version of Howl? Um, so in studying for this episode, I actually watched Yentl. So she was very serious. It took her over ten years to get that movie made. Um, and she directed it. She directed and it acted died. in it. It did really like critics like it got like reasonable reviews from critics and like won some awards. Um, but yeah, based on a short story of a a a Jewish girl living on a shtetl who wants to study Tal- Talmudic law, so she uh, dresses as a boy so she can study, but yeah. then falls in love with her classmate. Yeah, who's a boy who thinks he might be gay. Shout out to Phil Von Awesome, who's the best piece ever to Papa. Can you hear mm-hmm. me? But that's like, uh, yeah, she wrote the music for that that film and, and like decided to make it a musical. And she plays a character. And she like, there's a story that she was inspired. Like, the project kept getting canceled, and like no one wanted to produce it because they were like, it's too ethnic. <laughs> it's too. It's too ethnic. Yeah, for Hollywood. Come on. Uh, so they yeah kept getting turned down, and then yeah, I'm like, that's their. The name of the classmate that she falls in love with is, like, Anselm. And then she was visiting her father's grave with her brother, and the grave next to his had the name Anselm on it. And she was like, it's a sign that my father wants me to make this. So, super okay. genuine. Okay, all righty. That's why we yeah, love Barbara Streisand. Yeah, never question the sincerity of Barbara Streisand. I, n- I never will. Ever, I never will. Ever. Let's see. Give me some. Um... Give me some people. Um, somebody who's because we've done all like pop stars, right? It's like mm-hmm. Lady Gaga. I know Lady Gaga. Mhm. Yeah. It's definitely intentional because that is a Jer- she's a Jersey bitch. She is like the. That's that's what's like beautiful about it is that she's pretty fucking trashy as like a person, but then she pretends to be like a highfalutin person pretending to be trashy. But I'm like, you already are, <laughs> so you're just like being yourself. Yeah, I mean, she is both herself like very smart, but works with very smart people as well. Also, she might have killed team. someone and taken their darkness. <laughs> sure, um, but but yeah, she's an example of 
It's very calculated camp. To be fair, though. when you talk about a pop star, you're really talking about a team of like dozens whatever. Of who cares? Let's just talk stuff. about the pop star. Like, like yeah, okay. whatever. Uh, here's this one for you. Here's one that's fun. Eminem. <gasps> oh, I think. Oh God. Oh my goodness. I. You know what? I think he's serious because he tr- because he just was like, "Here's my music," right? And people were like, "I think he's." When I think Dr. Dre met him, he was expecting, like, a POC to show up. And it was... No, no, he got famous because he was a a white rapper who was talented. No, no, but, like, what I'm saying is he he didn't have his branding yet when he was sent. He was just like, I'm a very good rapper. Mm -hmm. No, he did. Okay. All right, whatever. Okay. I've I've heard his early freestyles. So you tell me the answer. I know the Westwood freestyle. It's amazing. It's really good. He's like, your sexy ass out, like out out the he's window. Like, this crowd will turn against you if you turn my facial tissue into a racial issue. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, no, he he like, yeah, he knows his classics. He know he knew where he was coming from, exactly where he was positioned in the industry, and I think his addiction to it was like sleep to pills. white beaters. Oh no! Sorry. His like his like rehab and addiction. He lost his sense of humor. But I think in the first oh like, he got addicted to sleeping pills like ah oh I didn't know that okay yeah his like first three albums he's like very self aware and and like of exactly he's, his place he's woke and then he woke and then yeah, he, he went to sleep <gasps> oh that's pills. so funny okay that's campy harsh <laughs> but uh he did he had this this dark period where. For like six years, he didn't put out any albums and was like... Because he was sleeping. Addicted to... Like, yeah, that's a very wealthy person addiction, right? It's like Nancy Kennedy or whatever, being addicted to sleeping pills. With like um, Ambien? I don't get it. Like, he just... Or like Xanax. I don't know which ones. I don't know. I just, being I just, addicted I just to read Ambien sleeping pills. No, probably is not like Ambien. The not saddest. melatonin. I was like, no, Ambien really does like make you sleep. And if you okay. don't fall asleep on it. Oh, it's Matt Loves Fire. Our, what? Our if we're favorite, talking about camp? Our favorite campy host. Ah. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, Secret Circus. An excellent campy production. Campy as fuck. Thanks to our host. <laughs> Thanks to our host. Because it has a... Uh, yeah, very serious premises. Because we took ourselves very seriously. <laughs> it's like a, a very serious, legitimate theater. And actually, when we do Secret Circus again, I'm going to not take myself so seriously because I did. And mm. it drove me it drove me crazy. And I've just, like, uncrazied myself. So Great. Yeah. Through this podcast therapy. Yep. All right. <laughs> yes. Mm. Who's another? Gotta have oh, fun. how about uh, RuPaul? Um, yeah, super self-aware. Like, but is yeah. he? Is he though? Because apparently he ha- he has like someone in his ear all the time telling him. I don't think he can like read and memorize a script, but I think he's still like it's, it's, like very smart and like very aware of culture and like the impact. Oh, true, of stuff. true, true, true. And we've specifically. You've, you've heard on podcasts and you I love about... this. Can I say it? I sure. love it. He goes, he's like, you know, sometimes, sometimes I just like to go to like Walmart and I just like to look around and see, you know, just see what's going on in culture. Just see he's what's up. That. Yeah. That. Yeah. Because he's like, he's like, because this is going to influence like the next drag challenge. We're going to be like, here's these new Walmart dog leashes and you have to make an outfit out of them. You have to, you have to make a look. Drag her. That's <laughs> Literally, like, you have to drag, mm-hmm. yeah. As long as you do it with love, as long yeah. as you do it with love, and you make me laugh, you gotta make me laugh. <laughs> Which is, I mean, could be that's, its own little yeah. summary of camp in, yeah. a, in a way. If it's done with love and it makes me laugh. Oh, yeah, that's the thing. He doesn't like when people... Wait, is camp authentic or not? In what sense? What? <laughs> what are you... What kind of... Because what are you he's always, like, getting mad at people if they're not their true selves. Yes. So I guess that's like bad camp when you're not when you're like faking it. I don't get it. Tell me, explain. <laughs> well, drag. I mean, drag race isn't just about doing camp. No, but there is something to that. Like I feel like I feel like a lot of people when they think they're being campy, mm-hmm. but they're oh that's what it is. They're afraid to go like all the way though because they're afraid of embarrassing themselves. That's when it fails. 
Yes. But then it, they're afraid of being vulnerable. It, it is true that like Rue wants you to have, and Drag Race wants you to have a distinctive style, and uh, like a signature of like what you're doing and your type of drag, and it should very much come from like your own character and be an extension of yourself. Right? Yeah. Like the best one method or technique of acting is you find like that part of the character within yourself, so that you can then like live in it. Yeah. Like, but this actually contradicts like the the. There's, like, that type of acting that was very, like, dramatic or whatever. And then there's method acting, which is, like, the opposite of camp. Because because there's no studying or, like, preparing for camp. I actually read... Well, method no? acting is trying to live as the character. Yeah. No, it's, it's against camp. Like, I literally, like, read something about this the other day. Okay. I mean, it's just, like... To be a method actor is like that's like Daniel Day Lewis or whatever. Because just it's like, subtle, but that's the thing. Being a method actor is like subtle and like the nuances. And camp is like not. It's like oh, big. Oh sure, camp that's is a big what I mean. Production performance, whereas method acting is like you try to be. Try to be that realistic, person. which is not camp. Sure. Yeah, it's Daniel Day Lewis becoming Abraham Lincoln for six months. But but <laughs> but Lincoln. Daniel Day Lewis. <clears throat> In his regular life, method acting, that's campy. Because, like, if he's at Starbucks being Abraham Lincoln, that's campy as fuck. Did you sure. get it? I yeah. Even know. Oh, my God. He's just a very serious man. So or, like, know. um, what's his face refusing to to blink in uh, Blade? Blade's oh. campy. Oh, yeah. Blade, Blade is, is so campy. campy. I, I mean, we said a bunch of, yeah. like, most action movies are like campy right and particularly like marvel and superhero movies and blade is like right there with them because it's like deadly serious star wars christmas spectacular oh yeah well that even more so because that was star wars trying to have be arthur oh my god golden girls how could we forget sure okay so let's talk about the girls actually was great because it was in the oscar wilde tradition of camp and that it was like just, just kind of like cunty, like back and forth. Cunty Southern these, bells, like, yeah. These, these well, like ladies. proper, but like everything is proper except you're a fucking well, cunt. Rue is, Rue is like, <laughs> and I mean Rue that. Can or whatever is a Southern bell, right? The original Rue. <laughs> yeah, the original Rue. And then there's like, uh, yeah, I forget the other one's names, but the. There's yeah, there's Blanche. There's there's Betty White. Blanche, yeah, right? Blanche Dubois. Betty White was the ditz. Yeah. And then uh, B. Arthur was like the serious one. The man. <laughs> the epicene. And then, yeah. Uh, and I forget the, the name of the actress who played the mother. Oh, Sophia Petrillo was yeah. like the mother. Yeah. Yeah, she was. She was like. She, she, she was. The, she, okay, her. Like, I love her. But like her, the female gremlin and fucking like Little Wayne are legit the same person. I swear to God. They've like never been in the same room together. She's so, she's so cute. She's such a they, cute Italian I'm, grandmother. D- little, like, little, yeah. little Wayne? Little Wayne or Little John? Which one? Looks, looks You're thinking like about Little Wayne. Little, little Wayne. Wayne. Okay, good. Like little Wayne, <laughs> the female gremlin, and her. Grizzled looking. Adorable. Years of codeine abuse. Adorable. Adorable. And they get evil after midnight. Mm-hmm. If you, if you feed them. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, she's, I'm just thinking she's like, she kind of reminds me of like a New Yorker. Sophia yeah. Petrillo. Yes, yeah, she is. She's, she's like, she's oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. Oh. I can't, I can't even. Let's talk about the fashion. Sure. Who are some campy fashion designers? Galliano. Oh, yeah, you can listen to her fashion episode, too, if you, if you want, like, of the full, the full beat. The full fashion beat. But uh, Galliano, oh, Mugler. Um... I mean, Karl Lagerfeld. Okay. But, like, what he did for Chanel was, like, modernize it, but he did, like, campify it a bit. Because mm-hmm. he was like, let's let's make this a little more... Oh, Versace? All, both? All of them? In different styles. So, right, wait, don't just name names, because those listening don't necessarily know, like... Moschino? Describe, Moschino? describe each house and, like, sort of why the style is campy. Okay, so... Mugler d- did a lot of really like. First of all, the runways are amazing, are amazing, and the the like the '90s ones, '90s to like 
early 2000s, they are stuff that you could, could not wear. They're, like, insane. Why? What's an example of, like, the Mugler outfit? Well, was he the Egyptian? Who did the Egyptian one that we saw? Can you look that one up? I sure. Yeah. Was I... Can you, yeah. Is that Yves Saint Laurent? Yves Saint Laurent? Yeah. Um, you'll find out. But Mugler is famous for that, like, superhero silver body, body robot that looks like um, the Svedka girl. That was Chanel, the Egyptian theme. Collection. Oh, okay. So the, yeah. But who is the designer, though? Okay. Yeah. So there's different designers for different houses. So. Yeah, Mugler does a lot of, like, futuristic, very, like, accentuated tits and ass, like, pointy oh, robot Oh, you're right. That was, that was Karl Lagerfeld. Oh, and that was, oh, so Karl Lagerfeld for Chanel did this crazy, like, Egyptian run, like, runway where they were, it was, like, the boat challenge from, like, season four of Drag Race where, like, they had, the models had these, like, legit, like, Egyptian boats on them and they, like, couldn't even walk. They legit couldn't walk, and they were, like, had this weird posture where they were, like, thrusting their hips, like, it was, like, this weird lean. Instead of doing a turn on the cow, they would kind of lean back. Yeah. So that one was crazy, extravagant. Also, GoPay has a really, GoPay is a newer des, uh, designer. Most famous Chinese fashion designer. Yeah, who does everything hand-beaded, these crazy shoes. They're just, like, in. They're just insane. They look like acrylic chunks. For example, chunks. like dresses and outfits inspired by Flo Blue China. Um, like those patterns that you see on like but the very fancy they're plates. They're just so big and dress. like you can't wear them. They're not realistic. They're just for the aesthetic. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, giant plastic shoes. Yeah, which I'll be wearing <laughs> this Saturday. Okay. And then um, what you said, Moschino, which the is... Your favorite, I think, with the McDonald's and... Moschino's, like, almost all of the, like... There's a ton of phone cases by Moschino, and they're all, like... <laughs> there are, and they look like a Windex bottle or, like, a or McDonald's a French fries. Perfume. The perfume was, like, a... Win there's, like, a... I think a Windex bottle-looking yeah. perfume. So, so there's a lot of, like... Uh, or the, the condom earrings? Condom earrings or, like, uh, made a cape out of, like fabric that has the Budweiser logo on it. So there's a lot of, like, repurposing... That was for the Met Gala. Yeah, that yeah. was in the Met Gala, like, camp exhibition. So a lot Damn. of, like, repurposing, uh, yeah, consumer goods and capitalist stuff as, like, high fashion or as, like, just other stuff. Yeah, something that's... Because, like, McDonald's, condom... Like, they're all, like... I guess condoms are not trashy, but, like, the look... Like, if you see a condom wrapper, you're like, oh, it's, like, a trash person. Aristocrats do not... Yeah, perfection. but then you make it out of gold, and it's like, okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Consumer um, goods, yeah. Yeah, Gautier also. The sailors? Mm -hmm. Like, sailors the ads? Are, sailors are generally just camp icons, I suppose, also. Yeah, but the, remember the Gautier, like, ads with the sailor? Like, they were just, like, sailor, hot sailors. Mm -hmm. Because the ads were, like, very hot. Ooh, American Apparel, camp or not. Not, I mean, not now, but, like... No, I don't think it ever was. That was just, like, that was, like... The LeMay, the ads, though? American Apparel is so funny because it was, like, was just an outdoors clothing store. What? And then it was, like, Dove Charney's, like... Yeah, I mean, American Apparel under Dove Charney. Sorry, under, yeah, Dove Charney's, like, specific <laughs> vision for the company. But the LeMay and the and fanny packs, no? Are we just... No? Trash? Just trashy? I don't think it was ever over the top enough. A lot of it was actually True. like pretty simple clothing. The camel toe, though, the accentuated it's camel toe. It's a way toe. of wearing it that was like, I guess, very sexual. Oh, uh, yes, Melanie, I'm missing you too. Lucky thirteen queen. Nice. Yes, we're talking about camp. Mm -hmm. Camp. Let's see. Oh, because. Because uh, Lucky Thirteen Queen is oh. into metal, who are some metal? I can think of like some metal camp icons. Can you? Oh, like heavy metal music. Camel toe. Like, who do we? Come on. Like Meatloaf. Oh yeah, I guess Meatloaf. Like Freddie Mercury. 
Fre- well, Freddie Mercury. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, immortal. Um, just like that aesthetic too has like a very it has like a crossover with like the 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 comic book art like the Mandy art like the fantasy yeah, the, the sort metal of yeah Boris Vallejo is like a, one of the quintessential artists of that like yeah. fantasy style it's, they make great tattoos also yeah that that style but yeah the the chainsaw on top of a pile of demons with like the hot girl yeah like, exactly like, that's on the ground. <laughs> and and lucky 13 queen is that hot girl oh okay <laughs> basically um um, a great example, I think, of a camp, a very campy, like, more recent metal band would be Dragon Force. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you know them, but they're, like, like, in the 80s and 90s, Megadeth was a band that was criticized for being too clean, because their guitar playing was, like, perfection. They were technically yeah. just exceptional, and people were like, it's, it's, metal heads would be like, come on, where's the grunge? Like, there's no, like, it's not actually dirty, or, like, it doesn't rock. But Dragon Force is like Megadeth squared and they're just like insanely technically good. So they were always like the hidden level on Guitar Hero would be a Dragon Dragon Force song. And so they're like and all the songs are like grab the fire of flame and kill the beast. Yeah, uh-uh. and it's like the like Megadeth, like this crazy falsetto guy singing. The band Rush it's like sort of metal. What? Yeah, the Canadian man Rush. It's like songs about Wait. trees and environmentalism. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, but I think but I feel so- like metal is is camp too because a lot of metal like they're like a lot of the artists are like actually they are very good. They're very like musically good, and the, and they're like screaming and they're the hair and like the makeup. It's, it's technical excellence singing about the plots of comic books for the most part. But but yeah, like the drummers from and religion bands are as we talked about before, like, like the devil. Yeah, and the devil. The yeah, devil and Satanism. And, like, which is yeah. So like, if anything, it's like an exception of uh, metal bands that aren't camp, right? Like Rob Zombie. I mean, Rob Zombie uses all the quotations from mm, like. I, I you don't like Rob Zombie. Oh, that's though. true. He does use like quotations use my body from all to these keep you alive. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. Or, like, living... I think he's pretty campy. Oh, I mean, Marilyn Manson is, like, super campy. He's super into it. He's into the exaggeration, the Ephesian male, female. His androgyny. His, his like... I mean, he also... Who did he date who had, like, the the banging bod? That he was, like, in love... Like, they had, like, a... Oh, the, the burlesque star. Yeah, exactly. Um, and he, oh, he had a whole album about, like, dandyism. Zita, was it Von, what's her name? Dita Von Tis. Yeah. Uh, he has an, a whole album that is about dandyism. And he actually, he has a song where he says that he's a dand, he's like, in the song, he's like, I'm a dandy. Like, I'm like the, it, yeah, it's. I actually, this is one of my favorite albums of his. I okay. love Marilyn Manson. I have so many pieces to his music. All right, I'll give you, I'll give you the camp factor then. He's also all about. He's like, I'm Satan, but also I'm not. Like, I'm God. I'm Jesus and Satan, and like, you know, everything. Yeah, he likes to use a lot of religious iconography, which, as we said, shortcut to camp. Shortcut to camp. <laughs> he uses religious iconography. Yeah. So let's see. I have. Oh, wait, so I guess we have to talk about the Met Gala, right? Oh, I was going to say, oh. we one other, I was thinking of the metal bands, right? Yeah. And so, like, I was thinking of, like, Metallica, which is, oh. like, a grittier quintessential metal band. They themselves, I don't think, are that campy. And, like, they also, like, they're, they're not singing in, like, a dramatic, crazy falsetto or anything. Like, they're, and they, like, keep it very masculine. So, like, I don't think you would say that they're camp, but one of their songs is For Whom the Bell Tolls. Yeah. Which is... Um, Bleh. Uh, what's his name? The writer who wrote for whom the bell tolls. Um, oh, it's it's is it about that writer? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so Susan Sontag actually calls out for whom the bell tolls as a piece of camp, which is funny because she. Calls oh, it, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a movable feast. Like who wrote the. And the sun also rises. 
and like, you know. That yeah, we know. We that person. <laughs> Man, it's hard to name all these names. Yeah, all these show. names. I know this right. isn't well, the you literature could, you could, show. You could look that up real quick. Oh, you um, want me to look it up? Okay. But uh, for whom the bell tolls is like very. It won a bunch of awards. It, it like should have won the Pulitzer, but the like the head of the Pulitzer Foundation found it like offensive. But it came out in like 1940, and is about the Spanish Civil War. But it's written in this really shitty translated Spanish. Ernest Ooh. Hemingway. Yeah, Hemingway. There you go. Duh. Uh, yeah. So we're in the bell tolls. So, is like, so campy. She considers it to be camp because it's like very serious about like the Spanish Civil War and like death and everybody's like facing death and and how they're all like comrades to, like fighting the fascists and stuff. But at the same time, like there's some very stilted love scenes in it. It's, like, written from the point of view of an American who falls in love with a Spanish resistance fighter. And, uh... So the... So this band... So the... the, So you're saying that that song is campy of them? She just... I think Susan Sontag regarded it. She's like, it's a very serious book. Executed terribly. (laughs) And then, like... Not written in Spanish and the translations are in this, like, very weird way that, like, Hemingway didn't seem... For whatever reason, he translated Spanish literally instead of like, like word for word. So it reads like very stilted English. Yeah, yeah. I was just looking anyway. up the, the these are like it's just like an illustrated guide to like illustrated examples. guide to camp. Oh, yeah. yeah. What so do you have there? the essence of camp is its love of the unnatural and of artifice and exaggeration. Sure. Oh, I so see. Share. Share and Cher. Madonna with her pointy tits. And Madonna with her. Uh, her bullet tits. Madonna's like serious about herself, right? Do you think she always was? Madonna's very serious about herself. I think she always was, actually. Always? Even when she dated Vanilla Ice and they made the book together. I think so. <laughs> yeah, I think she was like, she was like, I'm gonna show like our gorgeous bodies to like the world. They have to see this. There like, is a very that book is very cool. There is a very cool photo where she has a mirror. Or he has a mirror, and he's holding it up to his, like, nipple, but it's, like, her breast in the mirror. It's pretty cool. All right. You should get the book. I think you can get it on, like, Kindle. Mm. It's just pictures, too, edition. so you don't have to read. Um, yeah. Let's see. No, I think, uh, look, I mean, Madonna either went crazy at some point in the last, like, 40 years, or she was the whole time. Um, yeah. But I think, I think she's always been kind of loopy and very serious. Loopy and serious. So but, have, but I don't know that she... I don't think she has as much involvement in her songs as, like, Lady Gaga does, for example. So it's hard to say. With Every pop artist is different with how much involvement they have. But we didn't talk about Katy Perry. Yes, Katy Perry. Who's maybe the... Loves. Kind of the queen of camp, if anything. My truest love. Because, um, right, like, Gaga has done, like, songs and things that, like, weren't campy. She's done stuff seriously. She's Like her shit with Tony Bennett. She did an album of jazz standards, yeah, like because she is like, a classically like, like trained like Hollywood Vegas standards or whatever. She's a classically trained pianist. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, so, I mean yeah, playing playing piano on all her stuff, a lot of her songwriting and like yeah, she wants people to know that she good. She also killed someone. Ooh. Mm-hmm. But uh, no, she's kidding. Yeah, stuff that Maybe. stuff that you wouldn't you wouldn't consider. Can't, whereas Katy Perry, through and through, I don't think has done anything that wasn't. Yeah, and even like her yeah. with the shark, with the left shark. I mean, not not that she planned that whole for spectacle. that whole thing that with whole the beach, beach ball tits. <laughs> beach ball She's had so many things be her tits, like beach balls, whipped cream, and that's that's a very campy thing. Is like to, um, what do you call it? Like exaggerate your tits. Mm. Oh, Rule of camp number. Oh, no, no. Exaggerate your tits. Yeah, they're serious, and if you don't take them serious, if you don't take those tits <laughs> seriously, um, so yeah, it's it's a vision well, of the world. Oh, what? I wanted mm-hmm. to say too, but Katy Perry, even like her, like I'm trying to think of an example of like a a Lady Gaga like serious song, like a love song or something. Oh, um, the gay one with the mermaid. <laughs> The Gay Mermaid one, come on. Um, you and me or something like that? You and I? Yeah. No, Isn't that's that... like a Western. She's like a, she plays a cross-dressing cowboy, which actually is pretty campy. Oh, okay. Um, What's the mermaid one where it's like, 
where she's like a mermaid. Anyway, there have been parts of her career that weren't camp, whereas Katy Perry is like, even her serious ones, like Firework, like an empowering song. Do you just... ever feel like a plastic bag floating through the wind? I mean... It's a good American Beauty reference. But just... I'm, I'm definitely doing a piece very soon where I had that song playing and then I come out and do a pole piece dressed in trash bags. She's a great example, actually, of, of do you wonder if it's, is it intentional or not? Because, like... Firework, you watch the video and you're like, this is meant to be inspiring to, like, bully teens and, like, tell them that, like, it's okay, Katy Perry will shoot fireworks out of her tits. For you. For you. For you and you and you and you. It gets better. Yeah, it's it's a very, like, hashtag motivation, uh, bully teens. But, like, basically, which makes it, like, because it's failed seriousness because it doesn't fucking help any of that stuff. So is it, um, I don't know. It helped me when I was a teen. You you listened to Firework and were inspired by it? I was like, someday I'm going to move out of this small town. <laughs> okay. Just kidding. I've always been from New York, Maybe bitch. it does. Yeah, right? It's in the realm of, like, you'd be like, it's, as Sontag says, if you can put quotation marks around it. So, like, yeah. Firework is inspiring. Yes. Um, like if, you, if you're like... Yeah, partly brain damaged. You're like, wow. Wait, okay, here's how you know. Here's how you know. And religion, again, but the reverse. If she's religious, then she's serious about it. If she's not, Mm. then she's not. That's how, because like Hannah Montana or whatever, didn't she have like a pastor dad and like some of her shit? Her dad was Billy Ray Cyrus. Right? She's Miley Cyrus. Her dad was a country star. Oh, yeah, whatever. Country That's like, music star. Who had the pastor dad? Kesha. That's right. That's right. Okay, yeah. Yeah. We don't want to... Miley Cyrus, I don't even want to talk about. The fact that she's now abandoned hip-hop and gone back to doing, uh, like, not being, like, wild and doing, like, I don't know. You put that in quotations, though. She's back, she's back, <laughs> she's back to, like, wholesome music, I guess, and a wholesome image. Which is campy. Yeah. Miley Cyrus back doing wholesome. Doing wholesome. Maybe, yeah. Okay, so, yeah. What do you, um, Beyonce. I don't think she's campy. Destiny's Child. Certain things, sure. Like the glove and like the, the like girls dancing routine and like single ladies are like... No, but I'm saying, isn't that interesting, though? Like, Destiny Child was really campy. campy. Yeah, because it's like... But Beyonce is like, no, I'm going to go up and be beautiful. Like in Survivor, when they're, like, dancing in fatigues in the jungle And they're, like, crawling. They're, like, army crawling, but they have, like, heels on the beach. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. That's great, but, like, yeah, so much of what Beyonce does, actually, is, like... Oh! A rare case of she she nails it a lot of the time. Nicki Minaj. Campy. Yeah. Super campy. Now she's a mom, though, so... Yeah, I don't know what she's been up to. Uh, uh, what ass pussy? Yeah, I guess she would, yeah. Who's campier, Nicki Minaj or Cardi B? Well, no, Cardi B's kind of the new Nicki Minaj, right? Don't. D- no one is Nicki the new Minaj Nicki Minaj. Nicki Minaj wasn't a what ass pussy. What? That was Megan Thee Stallion and Cardi oh, B. Oh, Megan. Oh my god, Nicki Minaj is like edged out. She's gone. Yeah, that's what <gasps> I'm saying. I'm crying right now. You thought she was in that song because. No, I just. Because Cardi B has so stolen her I archetype died. that you thought she did that song. I wanted her to do that song, but I knew that she didn't in my heart. <laughs> no, yeah. No, but she had her whole pink Barbie thing. Or the black Barbie, but like, she was like... Pink Friday. Pink Friday, yeah. Yeah, the black Barbie. Pink Friday. Which is, Barbie is the campiest thing ever. Barbie's like camp. Yeah, yeah, her, her very like cutesy... She stuff. like a latex. She was like a Barbie, and she had mm. all the posters had. She, their mouth was just in like blowjob form. Mm-hmm. She was like, oh, uh, okay. So let's see more exam more things. Yeah, I think we covered. Oh yeah, the three million. That's the thing. A lot of people at the Met Gala, wore they feathers. were they wore feathers because Sonhag said that like. It's it's a, a woman walking around in a dress made of three million feathers, and they wanted to get off easy, so they... Just wore some feathers. They wore a bunch of feathers, or they wore sequins. The spirit of extravagance, as they say. Yeah. Which is a thing that underlies a lot of like modern pop music anyway, I suppose. I'll give you that. Oh, and this is the, the Oscar Wilde nod. The solvent of morality. 
It neutralizes moral indignation, sponsors playfulness. So there's that, what is that, Moliere, the, the swing? Mm-hmm. And then Oscar Wilde, <laughs> just looking. Oscar Wilde had a sweet brooch in this picture. He's a, he's a good uh, illustration for that quote, because Oscar Wilde, so much of like what he says is you're like, oh, that's terrible. Right. To, le- to lose one parent is a tragedy, but to lose two is just carelessness. Yeah. And then, yeah, a handbag, Mr. Worthington? Because, like, the parent, yeah, there, he's, like, he's like, my parents found me in a, in a handbag in the train station. And, which is, like, that's super campy, come on. And then, like, yeah, uh, they're like, a handbag? <laughs> We have to do a reading of that. My mom and I used to read that play together and eat cucumber sandwiches because I didn't know what they were. I was like, "What's a cucumber sandwich?" And my mom, my mom was like, "What do you? Well, what do you? What else do you put in the sandwich?" Butter. That's it. It's butter and cucumber. How is it? I mean, it's watery. I feel like some like you mix it with some cream cheese. You're onto something. No, it's not a bagel. It's like on whatever. I'll make I'll okay. make you I'll make I'm you know what? Bagels. You know what? I'll make you a cucumber sandwich. I'll make you into a cucumber sandwich. What are some examples right. of cannabis? That's enough. I mean? That's we've gone through all the quotes. We have the quotations. The quotations. Okay. Well, who else did you want to discuss? Well, I had I had a hundred. Which we won't discuss all 100. Oh, my God. Because we've done movies and... Drag. Uh, so drag is like, artists. hello. That's like where it is right now. Drag is where camp is. It, that's where it likes to live the most. If to be, you need... Yeah, so much of what it is, I suppose, with intentional campers well, is appreciating a camp aesthetic. The, appreciating it... Uh, Aspiring to extravagance in a silly but, way. But it's also playing on, like, the stereotypes of, like, masculine and feminine. So it's like extreme femininity or like androgyny or ex- it's an extreme like uh gender mm-hmm. portrayal like the padding the like you know it's like you can't just like put a i mean you can't you can do whatever you want but you know the the whole like padding thing is like no yes. i want giant t- like divine and pat like it was like to be clear. enormous tits it does need, you can't just pile a ton of shit on. It has to have a coherence to it. Like a, okay, Ma- Michelle Visage. Yes, it has to have a coherence, and it has to be well done. It can't be sloppy. So you can, you can, you know, you can't be pulling some Jiggly Caliente, like just pile a bunch of crap onto a dress. Or the bag, the bag dress. dress. Wait, it was the bag, the bag dress. Was that campy or not? No, because it was badly done. But it didn't, it... and it didn't even aspire to doing something extravagant. It just so, sucked. So, for people that don't know, Lala Re had like the worst look in Drag Race uh-huh. history. On the last season of Drag, literally Race. had like this. It wasn't even a dress because she didn't have enough bags to like cover her whole. It's more of a corset. Yeah. Her whole Lala. <laughs> Tried to just yeah, it was the bag ball. And you but they were like these little mini using, gift bags, and she bags. tried to like sew, and then she broke the sewing machine, so she just tried to glue the bags to a corset, and then like she didn't have enough, and it was like a shirt of little gift bags, and they were like falling off. I mean, it was falling apart too. It, it made was it especially so bad. sad. It, and uh, yeah, so I mean, yeah, Lalaurie was rightfully dragged for that look because but they didn't send her home no they should have but that's that's television so whatever but uh yeah it was a terrible terrible look because it didn't even aspire to going over the top and like fail in its execution which they're okay with witness like candy views with that weird alien like costume Oh my god, that weird alien costume that was wild cuz it was trying to do something really like funny and stupid and over the top. Well, it was also like she didn't discuss with her designer. She just she packed was, she all was the an fucking... astronaut like packing an alien. Yeah. Kidnapping it or whatever. Yeah. It was and... like trying to bring her down. It was like weakly trying to but choke her. But it was her. something. That, yeah, the judge was like, well, you... <laughs> no, he's you, this shot, last... you went for something. Yeah. This last season of Drag Race, I think they were liter- like, I feel like the editors or whatever like the crew like they were like just they thought they were being pretty subtle but really their choices were like this person needs to go 
and this person needs to stay, and you can figure out the narrative. You felt the show was very edited to, uh, to support that. I just think the judging didn't make any okay, sense. this is not a Drag Race Review podcast, so but let's keep it. But we are going to end it camp. with, just real quick, what we think. These are these are not necessarily camp, but they're the 100 best RuPaul's Drag Race runway, so I'm just going to go down towards the bottom, and we can say whether they're can camp you, or not. Can you show them. off, at least the the people watching... I'm scrolling to like the till we recording. get down towards like the you know the, the I know, but, lower digits. But show them the look. I'm getting to the looks that I'm gonna show. Okay, here's a good one. Um, oh, shout outs to Vulture who made this list, um, and they don't make you like click all through the pages. They're all in one page, which I really yes. appreciate. So this is Bianca Del Rio, and her, this is her finale look of season seven. And she's just wearing, like, all glitter. And and st- I don't know if this is sequins. The entire dress is silver glitter. But her face is glitter, too. And it too. extends. Her face is covered in the same finish as the sparkly silver gold dress. Which, so she looks like a, a statue, almost. Yeah, which is, that's over the top. If it was just the dress, I'd be like, mm, okay. But the fact that it's, like, her whole face, and also her expression is pretty campy, where she's like, ah! <laughs> she has, yeah, I mean, a huge, huge eye makeup above and yeah, below her, her eye, eyes. Yeah, that's what she does. And, the white line, remember? Uh-huh. She's like, I didn't draw the white line, I snorted it. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Do, do, do. We're going to find some more. That one sucked. Okay, Acid Betty, Neon Real Realness, Season 8, Episode 4. There she is. So her dress is pretty, like... Who took these photos? I don't know. <laughs> her dress... The background. Oh, yeah, her dress is, like... It has very long sleeves. and uh, But she has this, like, rooster comb situation. And also, the Neon Realness, like, it's not what I would think of as, like, neon. It's not, like... Day, like pink she used an interesting palette here and she has very like div- not divine she is very like divine-esque i think her eyelashes are so long that they make that shape of like the divine eye but they're actually her eyelashes oh yeah but the eye extends all the way to her forehead basically. and in that she has the pulled back like forehead mm-hmm. thing Oh, yeah, Katya, latex extravaganza, extravaganza, that she, like, made a latex dress, but it's, like, she also put a little thing on her nose, so she's, like, a swimmer as well. The whole thing is, yeah, she has a swim cap, so she looks like sort of a 50s, like, bathing beauty, but also, like, creature from the Blue Lagoon. Yeah. But then also, like, she's emerging from a bowl of roses. Yeah, and so this is the whole, like, things are not what they seem. Like, you, there's layers. Like, you look closer and you're like, oh, it's this. It's also this. I'm just going to get down towards the, ooh, what the hell? Aja, wigs on wigs on wigs. I don't even know what's going on here. This doesn't even look like a wig on a wig. It looks like she's a blow-up doll. But that's mm. a cool. These are your favorite camp looks. Well, I'm just scrolling, and I'm like, ooh, that one looks... I, that's the thing. When Whenever one, like, catches my eye, I'm mm. like, oh, yeah, that. You stop and take a look. Yeah. Oh, this, like a classic. Asia O'Hara with the feathers runway. This is how you do 3,000, however many feathers Susan Sontag said. Yeah, she's like a giant Tweety Bird. She's a giant Tweety Bird. But that's, that's, that's a, a that is very fucking campy. 3,000 feathers. That's what people should have done. There's a lot of superhero costumes in here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're kind of whatever. Oh, there's the giant, like, dandelion one. Asia, also Asia O'Hara. She's, like, a giant dandelion on her head. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I will say, Susan Sontag does say that nature can never be camp. Things that are in nature. There is a rustic camp, but it's human-made things that are in nature. So if like, Ooh, so like if the there's dandelion. like campy farmers or whatever. Well, the dandelion campy. is like an outfit made to mimic a dandelion, but nature itself, because it is naturally in its own state and there's no artifice, a waterfall cannot be camp. <laughs> like, How would you make a waterfall camp? 
you can't. No, but how would you come on? Could not, no. We're at Michael's. How would you make it campy? It has to be a man-made waterfall, perhaps inside a house. Yes, <laughs> there we go. Okay, I love that. Um, oh, what is this? Yeah, that's the number one. I do not. Okay, the last one we'll say the Courtney Act Animal Kingdom couture, where she like had she's just walking it's like regular and then she presses like this thing and these fucking giant wings come out like giant wings that's yeah that's camp it's so there's like another nature mm-hmm. thing that we're artificing you remember that yeah mm-hmm. we saw that and we were we were like what they're impressive wings yeah well She's walking with the wings closed up, but there are two big handles by her side. <laughs> like, I feel like I feel like she's going to press those, and she didn't, and the wings worked. That would be funny if she didn't. She's just like, that's just No, that's camp. The, right? Yeah. Subverting expectations. Yeah. Do we have any final notes on camp? <laughs> um, no, not really. I don't know that we've, you know, that's the whole thing. Because it's camp, we can't really give a final statement on it. Camp is everywhere, but nowhere. But you have to know how to look for it. Um, oh, I do. I, I, one thing that I did really like in the the essay towards the end is Susan Sontag says, she's like a, uh, a beautiful thing about appreciating camp or like having that aesthetic, is that you're never at a lack of things to appreciate or like. Whereas an aristocrat or somebody who's like a a dandy would be bored or disgusted by like a bad performance, right? It's like, well, they've denied themselves pleasure in the world. True. They've denied themselves a good time. Because if you have a camp aesthetic and can appreciate things on a different level because you're like, oh, oh, bless them. Oh, this is fucking terrible. Yeah. I, lo- I love it. But oh my God. Oh, oh yeah, those what is artists. Happening? Oh, she's crying now? The artists who are like, this is my art. This is serious art. And then they have like people in trash bags. And yeah. they're like, this is serious. Take it seriously. If you were like, okay, I'm taking it seriously, then you would be like. You're like, I'm taking it seriously, but I don't get Yeah, it. you'd be like, in your heart of hearts, you'd be like, hmm. But if you're like, oh my god, this is a train wreck, let's watch. Get the popcorn. <laughs> yes. Uh, you have found an extra way to enjoy and love life. So yeah. good for you. Or like, yeah, yeah. It's a little, yeah, sort of, sort of hedonist pleasures, I suppose. And you have to find them where you can. So that's kind of a, yeah, a beautiful thing about camp. Sontag breaks down, she thinks there's really like sort of three different ways to interpret art at least as of 1964. And so there's the high art morality, like when you look at... Which is like, let's... <laughs> you get high and you go to an art museum. Yeah, I was thinking like, go to Sistine Chapel and just be like, you get wow, high, I, am, I am awestruck by like the gorgeousness and the beauty of this art. And you um, go to the Sistine Chapel. Go look at a Picasso and be like, feel an emotional connection. You're like, I really feel high. Painting. Listen to Mozart, for example. Um... But then there's like the camp appreciation, which we've just gone through. Um, and what's the third way? The third, she was like, she's like, there's a form of art that's just pu- supposed to make you feel uncomfortable and sad, like Dostoevsky. Oh, like or, uh, Schenectady, New York. That might be a modern version of like cringe stuff, I suppose. Oh. Could be it. Like Utica. Or like curb your enthusiasm, I suppose, or like. <laughs> No, she's specifically talking about there's art that's make, supposed to just, like, explicitly, I think she's referencing, like, Kafka and Dostoevsky and existentialist literature and stuff that makes you feel uncomfortable, like, life oh, is terrible. Oh, like, in Girls, like, that box that, like, the box with the screaming things. Doubt Girls has... Yeah, no. maybe. That sounds like it was... It was. It, I mean, in Girls, they were making fun of that. Yeah. But, like, uh, what that was attempting to do of, uh, yeah... Art that does make you feel a certain type of way. You have an emotional connection so, to it, but not through, like, through sort of discomfort. My art so teacher. So camp is in between. My art teacher, mm-hmm. like, the only good one that I ever had that, like, actually said stuff was right and wrong. Like Susan Sontag. Because <laughs> yeah. there's some people that, that are like, it's art, it's beautiful, I'm going to accept it. And it's like, some art is just shitty, and, like, it's bad, and you can say that, and you can not consume it, and that's fine. Um... We have to have standards. <laughs> so just because it's art doesn't mean it gets a pass. Mm-hmm. That's right. Like, it doesn't matter how hard you worked on it. If it's if it's bad, it's fucking bad. It's 
Um, but my art teacher, I ran into her at like the uh, the bicentennial, like the Whitney mm. bicentennial. And she was like, "Your art was trash." And I hate no, it. no, she said, Can't "You know, it was done. bad." Like the Whitney, but it was like a bad art. Like it was this art was bad, and she said, "This is the art of despair." <laughs> Every six months, I'm disappointed anew. But she would legit, like, erase your lines, and she would draw them in, like, correct, which is, like, thank you, you know? Now I can draw pear. Wild. And perspective. She liked perspective. She liked pears. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I guess you learned something. I did. I'll draw you uh, I'll draw you for... But foreshortened yeah. something you know Sontag she sh- yeah she could have said she was like there's there's some art that is like heavenly like you know the Sistine Chapel or whatever and there's art that is takes you to hell like the Kafka and like disturbing existentialist stuff that makes and then there's Jewish uh, purgatory which is camp uh, or earth or just life on earth <laughs> there's life on earth also Jewish and purgatory and what we have is camp yeah. um, which is appreciating how things are done Oh, yeah, we didn't get. We skipped a couple of musical genres too. We did talk about heavy metal. We didn't get into what I feel is modern camp music, uh, which is like hyper pop. Kawaii super bass. Kawaii super bass. Uh, Sophie, R. I. P. Um, Hundred Gex. Wait, she died from Corona, right? Or no, she fell died off, during Corona. Fell off a roof while taking oh, a picture right. of the moon. Yeah, that's campy as fuck. <laughs> Fucking sucks. Um. But yeah, but uh, music oh yeah, that... Melanie Martinez, her whole crybaby aesthetic, crybaby also a very campy movie. She's something, yeah. That's not grandiose enough. It doesn't go for like I don't feel it's extravagant enough. That's true, to but like camp. babies. It's a thing. But like babies, it's they're a thing. It's not bad art. Human babies, it's not bad they're music. they're campy, right? I don't even know. I mean, it depends how babyish. <laughs> yeah. If you have a crib, you if you're can't just be. like sexy, but like no, have because a the, the element of youth, though, right? What if you're like you're married to someone, but they're your daddy? Yeah, but this and is they not, buy you. This onesies. is not just like youth in the sense of like they buy you onesies. twenty, like you know, twenty somethings. This is youth in the sense of like I'm a baby. I feel like that's pretty. I don't crazy. know how far you take the grandiosity of the the baby, the extravagance. <laughs> how far do you take the baby? How far? Whatever happened to Baby J? Are we wearing diapers? Are we using them? Are we breastfeeding? Are we... How baby is this baby? Yeah. <laughs> or are we just dressing like one? How far? Intention, yeah. Intention matters. Are we doing this because we think we can become a baby again? Or are we doing this because we just think babies the... creep people out? Yeah, Intention exactly. Matters. Um, yeah. So I don't know how to feel about Melanie Martinez. But clowns. I, the reason, if you could stop for a second, the reason <laughs> <laughs> clowns are getting... Depending. Something. You're Class saying me. shit. Stop. Uh, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, and the, the, the taking so much of, of hyperpop and Kawaii Future Bass are like extravagantly over the top production, like super detailed using weird 80s video game sounds and like Beyonce samples and like all sorts of like really stuff that I couldn't like replicate as a producer, difficult to make. Um, and it's you listen to it and you're like wild, but you're like this is a fucking mess. It doesn't like this is a song. This sucks, but God, it's so well done. Yeah. Fuck. Um, which I feel makes it camp. I feel like a lot of ASMR stuff is pretty campy because like it's like a love for something that is very like gaudy and like big fake nail, like a lot of that aesthetic. Because the things that make nice sounds, they're, like, really? beautiful. Yes. Is that true? Yeah, because it's, like, I love ASMR where they talk about their poly gel nails. And they're, like, you know, they're, like, okay, let me. But sh- it's ASMR. It shouldn't matter what it looks like. It does because I get visual ASMR, too. And one of, and my mom does also. And one of the things that we get is, like, very sparkly things. Very, but they have to be. So, like, either a lot of real diamonds, which, like, come on, we're not going to see that, or, like, a lot of Swarovski crystals, like, the mm-hmm. Bianca outfit or whatever, like, that. But then, the but then like, a very, like, careful, 
precious like love of it and display of it mm. because yeah with asmr they're like here's something that's tacky as fuck but i care a lot about it and i'm going to show you like all its intricate i'm going to whisper about it <laughs> yeah oh yeah so let's sit let's plug it let's yeah let's plugs. plug it so this this saturday well first off we'll, we'll say this friday Oh, this Friday! We might, we might see some of you in person because we're hosting a comedy show yes. at Secret Loft. So, yeah, 137 West 14th Street. Come see us. Maybe Come through. Buzzer. Number and two. We've thrown, oh, it says Secret Loft now. It says Secret Loft. We've thrown away so much stuff this week to make room to host audiences yeah. again. It was just mm-hmm. a giant prop closet in here for a while. Uh, but it still is a prop closet, but it's just all the best props. We threw out anything that wasn't campy. Yeah. <laughs> and then... Uh, Saturday, then we might see you virtually. Or in person. Or in you person. can come through. Just D- DM us ahead of time to make sure. Yeah, we're going to be streaming the aerial segments. Um, of Rave Review. Of Rave Review. Our famous, world famous Rave Review uh, live aerial and DJ set. And burlesque, because we and, have Bollywood And we 10. will have burlesque dancers. And yeah, we'll have, we'll have burlesque dancers. Oh, and we're going to be having scene. Kitchy, too, who's pretty campy, ironically. <laughs> Kitchy's campy. Yeah. She's like, I'm going to be wearing so much fucking glitter. You're not going to believe it. And I was like, oh, oh, I'll believe it. I believe it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. So, Rave Review is starting to transition into more of a house party vibe. Yeah. But so, if you want to come to any of them. You can get to stream, but you can hit us up if you want to Yeah. The out. stream is going to be, like, the highlights, right? And then it, just come in person, bitch. If you want the low lights. And we don't, yeah. Come in person. Like, and then uh, it's time for we'll that. see you next Wednesday at 8 p.m. for another question block. Yeah. And shout out. Happy birthday, Ariel. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. I'm turning 16. You're turning 16. And 69. <laughs> 16 going on 69. Great. Cute. Yeah. My favorite ages. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm 420 years old. Yes. <laughs> and that's how we met. Yeah. On 42069.com. <laughs> Uh, it's a match made in heaven. Great. Well. Yeah. Should you play us out? Yeah, I will. I'll play us out. Let's hit it. Let's hit the uh, share again. Let's or wait. Let's hang on. Do you have another song you want to? Should we do? Uh, should we do the no more wire hangers? If you, if you got. The oh, play, I have it. I do. Yeah, play it over. You can play it over this. Okay, to help disguise. Yeah, I have YouTube. Here we go. Yeah, these YouTube. two together, that's great. This is pretty campy. No, thank you. Okay, come on, come on. No more hangers! <laughs> What's my hangers doing in this closet when I told you? She's no serious? No more hangers ever! <laughs> She's got a great face mask on. Oh, yeah. What do I get?